Item number, SCP-518, Object Class, Euclid. Special Containment Procedures. SCP-518 is to be monitored by a field research team, consisting of at least three staff and one project lead, supplemented by two security staff. This team shall be based at Remote Observation Site 18, three kilometers from SCP-518. An automated security perimeter surrounding SCP-518 is to be established and maintained. One physical copy of SCP-518-1 is authorized to exist at any given time for the purposes of research. This copy is to be kept at all times in an opaque, protective sleeve, sealed in a locked container, and kept in storage locker 742 in restricted access wing 1 of Site-93. One electronic copy is permitted to be accessible from authorized terminals at Site-93 and Remote Observation Site-18. Any unauthorized instances of SCP-518-1 discovered by Foundation personnel are to be destroyed immediately. Description SCP-518 is a localized anomalous phenomenon catalyzed by the dissemination and exposure of SCP-518-1. SCP-518 is, currently, a complex in a small valley consisting of 11 wooden structures in varying states of repair, designed and built in the style of structures common in newly settled areas of the American West during the mid-19th century. These structures are arranged in a manner inconsistent with an established settlement. Buildings are arranged in a roughly circular pattern, with no regard to road systems or natural topography. One structure is currently located on top of a creek. SCP-518 is located in rural Deschutes County, Oregon, United States, in the vicinity of the Metolius River. SCP-518-1 is a short narrative, first documented upon the initial exploration of SCP-518. Whenever SCP-518-1 is read in its entirety by a sapient, comprehending individual, SCP-518 undergoes spontaneous physical changes. In most cases, these changes entail the movement of structures in relation to each other, rearrangement of the interior features of these structures, and a small amount of subsidence in the immediate geographic vicinity of SCP-518. In some cases, readings of SCP-518-1 will cause new structures to appear, or existing structures to simply cease to exist. Research has determined that these physical changes occur either instantaneously or at speeds beyond the observational capability of current technology. The buildings that make up SCP-518 superficially resemble commonly found structures of the region during the 1850s and 1860s. In addition to several houses, there are currently a barn, a three-story hotel, and a sawmill. However, the interiors of these structures are atypical of traditional dwellings and establishments. Features such as walls, floors, and ceilings tend to be arbitrarily constructed. Houses have been observed to have rooms with no doors, non-level floors. One dwelling is constructed with a floor at a 37-degree angle, ceilings of a height of one meter or less, etc. Furniture and household items typical of the period are also present, but are arranged haphazardly. In several cases, chairs and beds have been observed nailed to walls and ceilings. Other buildings contain no features inside, while the barn merely covers an open shaft, extending to a depth of 120 meters. The land area comprising SCP-518 is gradually undergoing conversion into a sinkhole, and is currently experiencing subsidence at a rate of approximately 2 to 3 meters per SCP-518-1 event. Current projections estimate that SCP-518 will be completely submerged by the local water table after 25 to 30 additional SCP-518-1 events. Below is a partial transcription of SCP-518-1. This is the last will and testament of me, Asa Rutledge of Gretz Hollow, Kentucky, made this 11th day of February 1859. I bequeath no material possessions, having none. Though my soul be condemned to hell for what happened here, I direct that my final wishes be carried out in full. This place, and all that happened here, shall be forgotten by man, 
and buried under the earth until the day of judgment. Though nothing is hidden from the Almighty, this being the only atonement I can now offer, I will it thus. By the power left to me, which I pray is still sufficient to this task, let this testament be the means to conceal my shame, and let the tools of remembrance be turned to the act of forgetting. May providence hasten the vanishing of this place from the earth. Since the establishment of containment, the Foundation has documented fifteen spontaneous changes in the composition of SCP-518 that can be reasonably traced to the reading of SCP-518-1. Of these incidents, thirteen have occurred under controlled research conditions. Expansion Log 518-1 Upon initial containment in February of 1992 and the establishment of Remote Observation Site 18, Staff undertook an initial exploration of SCP-518. Note: At the time, SCP-518 consisted of nine structures and included a church and a schoolhouse that do not currently exist. The sawmill structure and two current houses had not yet manifested. A team consisting of four D-Class personnel was dispatched to the site, equipped with two-way radios, flashlights, water, emergency rations, crowbars, and a camcorder. Dr. Lupe Carmona, then the research director for SCP-518, supervised the exploration from Remote Observation Site 18. Selected transcripts are reproduced below. Dr. Carmona. Supplies have been checked and accounted for. All personnel present. D-3299-5, do you read me? D-3299-5. Copy. Dr. Carmona, time is 1,405 hours. Please proceed to the first structure in your field of view. D-94237, please keep the camcorder trained to your front in order to maintain our video feed. D-94237, copy. Video feed shows exploration team proceeding to an SCP-518-A structure resembling a house. Team reaches the front door and attempts to enter. Door is locked. D-3299-5. It won't budge. Dr. Carmona. You are authorized to force entry. D-22343 and D-9423-7. Force door open with crowbars. D-3299-5. It's pretty dark in there. Dr. Carmona. Illuminate the area and get video of the interior. Flashlights from off-camera reveal that the interior of the structure is typical of a structure of the apparent time period, with the exception of a dresser mounted on the ceiling and a floor sloping at a pronounced angle towards the southern wall. D-94237 You seeing this? Dr. Carmona Affirmative. Please proceed carefully into the house and document the surroundings. After 6 minutes and 58 seconds of visual documentation, a small door in the northwest corner of the structure is visible in the floor. Dr. Carmona D-4898-3 Please open the door in your field of view and document your findings. D-4898-3 Copy D-4898-3 opens the hatch in the floor. After other exploration members illuminate the opening, a crawl space is revealed to be accessible through the hatch. Dr. Carmona D-4898-3 and D-2234-3, please proceed into the space in front of you. D-2234-3, I don't know, man, I think… Dr. Carmona, please proceed into the space in front of you. D-2234-3, copy. D-2234-3 and D-4898-3 take the camcorder and their flashlights into the crawl space. All indications are that it is an ordinary crawl space, until D-22343 pauses. Dr. Carmona, you've stopped. Have you found anything? D-22343, there's holes all over the place in here. Almost sprained my damn ankle. Dr. Carmona, please describe what you're seeing in detail. D-22343, there's… there's a bunch of little… Rectangular holes in the dirt here, about uh, 50 centimeters or so long, maybe a little bigger, narrow. Dr. Carmona, 
Is there anything in the holes? D-22343. Hold on. Let me take a look. Um, it's, uh... What is that? D-48983 positions the camcorder over D-22343's shoulder. D-48983 appears to be handling an undetermined object while crouched over a hole. Dr. Carmona, what are you handling? Please refrain from any unnecessary forensic contamination. D-22343, it's, uh, it's nothing. There's nothing in any of these. Dr. Carmona, I don't believe it's necessary to remind you of the terms of your... D-48983, it's nothing. There's nothing in here. Dr. Carmona, please spend another few minutes documenting this space, and then proceed to the next staging point. Video feed indicates that the floor of the crawl space is filled with dozens of holes, corresponding to D-22343's description. D-48983 and D-22343 then rejoin the other exploration members without incident, and leave the structure. Video feed is turned off until the exploration team reaches the church structure, then present at SCP-518. Dr. Carmona orders the team to proceed inside, where they discover an entirely empty structure. The exploration team documents the interior until D-32995 pauses at the southwestern wall. Dr. Carmona, D-32995, do you have an observation? D-32995, there's some writing on the wall over here. Hey, get that camcorder over here. Dr. Carmona, is the writing legible? D-32995, mostly. It's kind of smudged in some places. Looks like it's written in soot. Here, let's get the video feed in here. Camcorder is brought to the writing, identified later as an instance of SCP-518-1. D-32995, this is the last will and testament of me. Not sure what this is. Dr. Carmona, please transcribe it as best you can. D-32995, copy that. D-32995 attempts to copy down SCP-518-1 on a small notepad. Discussion occurs between D-32995, D-22343, and D-94237 as to possible word choices for smudged portions of the original text. After approximately 25 minutes, D-32995 finishes writing and appears to read his notes. A low rumbling sound immediately starts and the camcorder appears to start shaking. D-94237. What? What the hell? What's going on? D-22343. Shit. Dr. Carmona. What's happening in there? D-22343. We gotta get out of here. Now! Now! Dr. Carmona. Permission to abort denied. Stand by and... D-48983 can be heard in the background to be softly laughing. An unidentified member of the exploration team starts screaming. A loud crashing noise is heard before audio and video contact is lost. Dr. Carmona. D-32995, do you read? What's going on in there? Do you read? End transcript. Item number. SCP-567. Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures Site-41 has been established at the former castle for the purpose of containing SCP-567. The entrance to SCP-567 is to be kept sealed at all times. All cell doors are to be monitored off-site via CCTV. In the event that a door is opened or breached, Task Force Delta-9 hacks is tasked with containing the instance of SCP-567-9 immediately. If containment proves impossible, termination is authorized. Because of the nature of SCP-567, and the proximity to it that TF-Delta-9 will be working, to join TF-Delta-9 an applicant must have a clean criminal record, have never committed any crime, even at the orders of the Foundation, be of moderate political beliefs, have strong convictions as to the importance of upholding the law. Have a strong fear of offending others with their actions. 
Description SCP-567 is located in the dungeon beneath Site-41, located in Data Expunged. It consists of a series of eight cells, designated SCP-567-1 through SCP-567-8. With the majority of people and objects, the cells remain inert. However, when individuals meeting certain conditions come within 2.5 meters of a cell door, shackles will materialize and launch from inside of the cell, restraining the subject and dragging them within. Once the cell door closes and locks, both the subject and shackles vanish, leaving behind no trace of any kind. Each cell appears to have its own unique trigger conditions in order to activate, which seem to involve committing some sort of criminal or heretical act. These triggers and resulting responses are similar to other anomalies involving disproportionate law enforcement, such as SCP-1002 and SCP-2701. Cell Trigger Conditions SCP-567-1 Individual has committed theft. SCP-567-2 Individual has committed rape. SCP-567-3 Individual has committed murder involving data expunged. SCP-567-4 Individual has committed murder involving data expunged. SCP-567-5 See Addendum 567-1 SCP-567-6 Data expunged. SCP-567-7 Data expunged. SCP-567-8 Unknown SCP-567-8 is unique in that, unlike the other cells which all stand empty, it contains a single wooden chair. The chair is nailed to the floor in the center of the room and appears to be many years old, though it does not rot. SCP-567-8 has never activated. On rare occasions, the cell doors of SCP-567 will open and release an entity. Given the designation SCP-5679-X, the X being replaced with an integer, SCP-5679 usually takes the form of a previously undiscovered creature and is always aggressive. Once out of its cell, SCP-5679 typically attempts to break out of SCP-567. There seems to be no common trait of the creatures given designation SCP-5679, except that they tend to be very aggressive and relatively intelligent. As well, every instance of SCP-5679 has had burn marks around its appendages. See Incident Report Log 5674012 for details. Incident Report Log 5674012 Date May 19 Subject SCP-5679-1 Description Though there were two reported incidences of SCP-5679 before the Foundation arrived, SCP-5679-1 was the first incidence observed by the Foundation. It was discovered by Agent and was approximately two meters in length. Though it walked on four limbs, its front limbs had human-like hands, capable of operating complex devices. SCP-5679-1 was quite intelligent and was able to deduce the operation of a data expunged. There were a total of 14 casualties prior to its containment. Date June 19 Subject SCP-5679-2 Description SCP-5679-2 appeared shortly after Site-41 was fully established and quarantined and took the form of Data Expunged. Foundation personnel suffered nine casualties before it was destroyed with remote explosives. Agent who participated in the containment of SCP-5679-2, is currently undergoing psychological counseling for his experience. Date July 19 Subject D834200 Description D-834200 was used as part of testing to determine the trigger conditions for each cell. 
when placed in front of the cells SCP-567-6 and SCP-567-7 both activated simultaneously and attempted to draw DA-34200 in. After a brief struggle, DA-34200 was The individual body parts vanished as per the usual, once drawn completely into the cell. Date July 19 Subject SCP-56795 Description During testing of SCP-5674, when the cell door was opened, SCP-56795 manifested and immediately attacked and killed Dr. without warning. It took the form of data expunged. Due to the presence of high-value personnel, standard containment procedures were not feasible. After a total of seven casualties, was able to lure SCP-56795 back towards SCP-5674, at which point it activated, drawing SCP-56795 back into it. Date December 2000 Subject SCP-56798 Description On December 2000 the door to SCP-5677 was observed to open and close via CCTV, but no instance of SCP-5679 appeared on the monitoring system. Two weeks later, he was found dead in his bed, in circumstances identical to those of deaths involving SCP-966. Mobile Task Force IOTA-1 was dispatched and located SCP-56798 within Site-41. SCP-56798 appeared similar to an instance of SCP-966, with variations and data expunged. SCP-56798 was successfully contained, and facility cameras were upgraded to observe additional wavelengths. End of report. On only two occasions have individuals placed inside a cell by the Foundation reappeared. In the first instance, D-903912 escaped from SCP-5673, 68 hours after being placed in it. Subject was suffering from severe injuries, including several lacerations, internal bleeding, and burn marks around his wrists and ankles. D-903912 died several minutes after reappearing, before TF Delta-9 could reach him. In the second, D-937122 appeared 157 months after being placed in SCP-5676. D-937122 attacked Foundation personnel on site, despite also having suffered serious injuries, including head trauma, several missing fingers, and burn marks around her wrists and ankles. Once restrained, D-937122 was interrogated by a member of Task Force Delta-9. See Audio Log 567-937122 Audio Log 567-937122 Begin Log Agent R-21 Please state your name. Heavy breathing is heard from D-937-122. No response. Agent R-21 Please state your name. D-937-122 does not respond. Agent R-21 Look, I am very sorry, and I want to help you, but we can't give you medical attention unless you cooperate with us. So please, please state your name for the record. D-937-122 My name? You want to know my name? Fuck my name! There is no name! There is no anything! But, but there is. I escaped! I got the metal off! None of the data expunged. I should be free! Let me go! D-937-122 is heard struggling, apparently attempting to escape. Agent R-21 I apologize, but now we have the opportunity to- D-937-122 Interrupting Agent R-21 Fuck your opportunity! There is no opportunity. There is only escape. You called me a monster. Maybe I am one. But the nightmares, the unintelligible mumbling, compared to their crimes, I've done nothing. 
Nothing at all. They... Data expunged. I haven't done anything wrong. Nothing. End log. Closing statement. At this point, D-937-122 breaks down into hysterical sobs. Agent 21 attempts to calm her, but she only grows more hysterical. D-937-122 begins gasping for air and appears to go into cardiac arrest. Attempts to revive D-937-122 fail. During the autopsy, D-937-122's body is revealed to be covered in tiny puncture wounds and has an unknown toxin in her bloodstream. Addendum 567-1 Further testing with SCP-5675 has revealed that it is triggered by those who have committed adultery. It is also noted that not all individuals who have committed theft trigger SCP-5671. Consistent patterns have not yet been established. Item Number SCP-574 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-574 is located within Containment Site 105, which is surrounded by a concrete barrier 3 meters high and 1 meter wide. Warning signs are posted at the edge of the Foundation-owned property. Once per month, a live adult pig, Sus Scrofa, is to be placed within SCP-574. Any additional buildings not being cultivated for study are to be demolished by Mobile Task Force Psi-7, Home Improvement, as soon as it becomes feasible. The interior of SCP-574 is monitored by both cameras and high-definition microphones. Any anomalies in SCP-574's interior are to be reported immediately. Description SCP-574 is a former factory in United States. The exterior appearance of SCP-574 is metamorphic, with over 328 distinct appearances on record. The interior contains three floors, with industrial equipment in varying states of decay. When a subject approaches within 40 meters of SCP-574, it will manifest a campfire near one of its upper windows. If the subject does not continue to approach it, several more campfires will appear, with human silhouettes being visible in the windows. If the subject does enter SCP-574, it will create several signs of human habitation. SCP-574 has been known to commonly manifest broken beer bottles, sleeping bags, clothing, and empty food cans, as well as concentrated deposits of ammonia, urea, and other compounds commonly found in urine. As the subject continues to occupy SCP-574, the floor beneath them may suddenly collapse, causing them to fall into the basement. Upon impact, the basement floor will take on the properties of wet cement and forcibly drag the subject underneath before hardening. When active, concrete within the basement of SCP-574 has been found to be acidic with a pH of 3.5. If SCP-574 consumes more than three subjects in one month, additional facilities will begin constructing themselves around it. These will be support facilities for a factory, such as an electrical power plant, or a market to sell the goods produced within the factory. If allowed to build completely, these structures will become derelict and begin sharing SCP-574's properties. When it was initially contained, SCP-574 was surrounded by two power plants, a marketplace, and the remains of a harbor. If SCP-574 is denied food, these structures will begin manifesting more enticing items, such as silhouettes of women undressing, the cries of distressed animals, and the odors of food and cannabis. SCP-574 was initially discovered on 9-18-1995, when a homeless man called paramedics to it. Upon arrival, the subject claimed he had taken up residence within SCP-574 and had witnessed the deaths of other subjects due to SCP-574's effect. After several paramedics were killed, reports of the anomaly reached Foundation agents embedded in the American military. Containment was successfully enacted by members of MTF Psi-7, Home Improvement. 
As of 10-30-1995, all witnesses were issued Class C amnestics, and SCP-574 was classified as Euclid. Addendum Interview 574-A Interviewed Subject 574-A Interviewer Dr. Yankovitz Forward Interview taken during initial containment Begin log Dr. Yankovitz So, please tell us how you came to find the structure. Subject 574-A You mean the factory, right? I guess, uh, I mean, it was some place we all knew about. Good night's sleep, warm, usually kinda dry. Dr. Yankovitz. It was a well-known squatter camp. Subject 574A. Well, not a camp. You see, nobody wanted to live there. There was noises, sometimes, at night. Spooked the hell out of me when I went there a couple of times. Dr. Yankovitz. Why did you go on the 18th? Subject 574A. Ah, shit, now I gotta think about this. Uh, shit. Probably Frank, or his little posse, told me we was gonna be staying up there tonight to talk about something. Dr. Yankovitz. And you went? Subject 574A. They said they had some baked beans. So, shit, yeah, I went. Dr. Yankovitz. What happened when you arrived? Subject 574A. Well, nothing much at first. I bummed around. <laughs> on the first floor. Heard a lot of people on the next one up, but I didn't really want to bother with those guys more than I needed to. Dr. Yankovitz. Please get to the point, if you can. Subject 574A. Right, sorry. Tend to, uh, ramble about stuff. Anyways, so... I'm bumming around on the first floor, and Frank's crew comes down. Frank starts preaching to the dozen or so guys there, talking about a place where we'd never need to worry about cops or gangs or nothing. We asked where it was, and he said we was in it. Dr. Yankovitz. What was the general reaction? Subject 574A. Confusion, because that shit didn't make sense. He goes on about there being a lot of new buildings around here and how they was going to make even more for us. Then, he started asking for volunteers. Dr. Yankovitz, please, continue. Subject 574A. Sorry, sorry. So, he takes the volunteers and sticks them under this big rusty ass pipe. Next thing you know, they got swallowed up by the rust and the grunk on the floor. We could hear them screaming and breaking. It was like a speaker outside a store. It was horrible. Dr. Yankovitz. I'm sorry. Did it go on for long? Subject 574A. Yeah. Frank tried telling us to chill out because we didn't have to die and we could live for free. But he got shouted down and then a few people got rough. Then the floor started to rumble. People were falling left and right. God. I... They was killing each other, even down there. I saw it. They choked each other before being just drowned in that cement. Frank was hollering his lungs off till the cement set. Fuck. I just wanted beans, you know? Didn't need that shit. Dr. Yankovitz. So that was when you left and contacted the authorities. Subject 574A. Went to the corner store, yeah. Are we done? Please? End log. Closing statement. Subject was issued Class B amnestics following this interview. Item number SCP-636. Object Class Euclid. Special Containment Procedures. The building containing SCP-636 has been officially condemned for supposed mold contamination and the lot fenced off to prevent unwanted intrusion. A minimum of two armed undercover guards are to be posted at ground level, and any unauthorized individuals attempting to enter the building must be detained and questioned. Any experimentation on SCP-636 must only be performed with prior permission from at least two Level 3 personnel. Description 
SCP-636 is a maintenance elevator at the hotel, located at Data Expunged. Unlike the other elevators in the building, SCP-636 contains a magnetic card reader, which, when used with a specific card key, will cause the elevator to move to a third sub-basement beneath the building. According to the building plan, there are only two sub-basements beneath the building, and the owner of the property was not aware of an elevator with magnetic card access. Whenever any individual attempts to access this floor via SCP-636, the elevator appears to work normally. However, upon reaching this non-existent floor, all contents of the elevator, including any personnel or remote monitoring equipment, will disappear. Exploration of the elevator shaft itself has yielded no useful information. While the shaft does extend to a third sub-basement level, there are only blank walls at that depth, and video cameras placed within the shaft have shown no unusual activity when the elevator reaches the bottom. Furthermore, SCP-636 will periodically move to the third sub-basement level on its own. Upon its return to ground floor, the elevator car has occasionally contained anomalous objects, as documented below. SCP-636 came to the Foundation's attention on 2000 following the disappearance of two elevator mechanics during routine maintenance of the building's elevator systems. A two-man initial exploration team was sent into SCP-636 and subsequently lost, after which the site was placed on lockdown and the owner and all witnesses given Class A amnestics. Current containment procedures were put into effect shortly afterward. Addendum 636-1 Log of Notable Anomalous Events Date 2000 Description SCP-636 called to bottom floor for approximately six minutes before returning to ground floor. Upon its return, the fully disassembled parts of two helmet-mounted video cameras were found on the floor of the elevator car. Analysis of the components confirms that they belong to the members of the initial exploration team. Memory cards and recording media of the cameras were blank. Date 2000 Description SCP-636 called for approximately two minutes before returning to ground floor. According to the testimony of the armed guards stationed at ground floor, the walls of the elevator car were covered with hundreds of human eyeballs that tracked them for several seconds before the doors closed and the elevator was recalled to the bottom floor again. Elevator car was found empty afterward. Date 2000 Description SCP-636 returned after 4 minutes and 17 seconds and contained approximately 11 kilograms of shredded Egyptian cotton fabric, soaked with blood. Analysis of the blood samples are inconclusive, as recovered DNA does not seem to match that of any known terrestrial animal. Date 2000 and Description SCP-636 returned after 8 minutes and 42 seconds. Upon opening, a naked and emaciated male later identified as Agent of the initial exploration team, began pounding on the buttons and screaming that he had to go back. Agent managed to disarm and kill one armed guard and injure the other before running back into SCP-636 and disappearing. Item Number SCP-655 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures Site-731 has been established at the premises of SCP-655. Personnel are advised that due to chronic political instability in the regime of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, no recognition of Site-731 as a Foundation asset exists at a national level. Site-731's activities occur under the auspices of Kreutzfeld Pharmaceuticals GmbH, a Foundation front organization and the facility is to maintain cover as a tropical infectious disease research outpost. Site-731's security protocols are set at Code Green, and security personnel are to be attired and equipped as members of a mid-sized private military contractor. Subsequent to the events of 0729-2002, 
Site 731 security personnel must receive specific authorization from the Level 4 Central African Affairs Coordinator prior to actively engaging armed groups approaching the security perimeter of SCP-655. All SCP-655-A specimens are to be catalogued and observed for a minimum of two weeks when possible. At the discretion of the site director, specimens may either be held for observation indefinitely after this initial period, or euthanized, autopsied, and preserved in the Site-731 Biological Archives. Description SCP-655 is an 18-meter by 20-meter by 4-meter windowless structure within a complex of buildings located approximately 35 kilometers north-northeast of Kisangani, Democratic Republic of the Congo. This complex was originally known as the Stanleyville Imperial Biology Institute and was established by Belgian Congo colonial authorities in 1898. The complex housing SCP-655 was coterminous at the time of its establishment with a now defunct cobalt mine. SCP-655 is the site of an anomalous phenomenon. At random intervals, which to date have been observed to be between a range of 2 months to 11 years, an organism of the Kingdom Animalia will spontaneously appear within SCP-655. These organisms are collectively known as SCP-655-A. SCP-655-A appear upon initial visual inspection to be typical specimens of a variety of animals. Most specimens observed have fallen under the Chordata phylum. However, mollusks, arthropods, and echinoderms have been observed on a less frequent basis. Specimens of SCP-655-A will, however, exhibit radically different behavioral and biological characteristics than other observed members of their species. Invariably, MRI examinations, CT scans, ultrasound imaging, and dissection of SCP-655-A specimens reveals biological structures not occurring in what species a specimen appears to be. These have included a specimen of Epatridus goliath, giant hagfish with a lung-based respiration system, a Crocodilus niloticus, Nile crocodile specimen, entirely lacking in any discernible structures associated with digestion, a Homo sapiens specimen with the entirety of its neural tissue located in a cavity in its right thigh, and an instance of Decello lychee, blue-winged kookaburra, exhibiting a circulatory system completely lacking in blood vessels and arteries. Since containment was established at Site-731 in 1961, researchers have documented 172 instances of SCP-655-A. Over the approximately six decades of Foundation control of SCP-655, with the exception of Incident 655-21, no species have been observed that was not at the time known to the contemporary scientific establishment. This has been corroborated by the appearance of a Conus dondani specimen, a variety of cone snail, in 1984, three years after first being described in scientific records, and a Lasirius ebonus, hairy-tailed bat specimen, appearing 18 months after its initial description in 1994. Recovery Log 655 SCP-655 came to the Foundation's attention after several partially substantiated reports in the Congolese media of a non-communicative man with no identification, clothing, or possessions of any kind, wandering into the outskirts of Kisangani. The man later designated SCP-655-A1, died of unexplainable causes, soon after being taken into custody by the local police force. A subsequent medical examination revealed two vestigial limbs in SCP-655-A1's abdominal cavity, along with the heart and lungs. SCP-655-A1's digestive system was, in turn, found to be located in its thoracic cavity. Foundation personnel monitoring the region intercepted the reports filed by the Kisangani Coroner's Office and initiated information suppression protocols. A subsequent investigation of SCP-655-A1's origins led to the discovery of SCP-655, 
and the establishment of containment. Upon establishment of initial containment, Foundation personnel discovered that the site of SCP-655, while in a state of decay consistent with structures abandoned for several decades, appeared to be undisturbed by human intrusion. Since the last documented activity of the Stanleyville Imperial Biology Institute in 1919, despite the presence of valuable raw materials at the site, Foundation staff at the time attributed this to the research facility's reputation with the local population. Institute staff appear to have systematically destroyed all documentation related to activities taking place at the SCP-655 site before abandoning it in 1919. The following materials were recovered upon establishment of containment. A reinforced secondary door made of wrought iron installed over the entrance to SCP-655. Five barrels of calcium carbonate. Fifteen wooden beds in various states of disrepair. Three bookcases each accommodating an average of 80 volumes, eight sets of iron manacles and chains, a mahogany desk, two examination tables, two Springfield Model 1892 99.30-40 Krag caliber rifles, a flexible wire surgical saw, three flower pots, inspection of the area surrounding Site 731 revealed four mass graves believed to date from 1900 to 1917. These graves contain skeletal remains from a variety of animals. However, due to the apparent systemic dismemberment of the organisms interred in these graves, precise numbers of individuals and species are impossible to ascertain. No anomalous properties have been associated with these remains at this time. Incident Report 655-21 Level 4 Eyes Only On 08-10-1978, a specimen of Homo ignotus, hereafter, SCP-655-A21, manifested in SCP-655. This was the first and only observed instance of a life form, not officially documented by the mainstream scientific community, appearing within SCP-655. In contrast to three prior incidents on file involving similar specimens, SCP-655-A21 exhibited behavior interpreted by researchers as emotional distress, a trait heretofore unobserved in H. Ignotus. Despite a state comparable to fear or terror, and being highly agitated, SCP-655-A21 displayed none of the self-defense mechanisms common to its species. In addition, it was either unable or unwilling to enter the theorized perception-reality-shifting state documented elsewhere by Foundation staff. Under orders from Site Director the two-week observation period was waived in light of past experiences with H. Ignotus specimens. After no deviation in the subject's behavior, at that time consisting of huddling in the furthest corner of SCP-655 and trembling, was observed for four hours. SCP-655-A21 was terminated by a small arms fire by security staff. An autopsy was performed, the results of which were transmitted to Overwatch Command. The final autopsy report remains a Level 5 security document at this time. Before scheduled incineration could occur at 0700 hours on 08-11-1978, the remains of SCP-655-A21 were somehow transferred outside of Foundation custody. Despite standard security measures taken at the Site-731 morgue, no physical evidence remained of SCP-655-A21 when technicians inspected the refrigerated holding container. Security footage throughout the facility did not document any intruders or unauthorized entry into the morgue. Item Number SCP-664 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures Protocol G316U Containment of Geographically Immobile Anomaly Urban Subset is to be followed, with a containment perimeter established at the property's boundary. Testing is disallowed at this time. Description 
SCP-664 is an anomaly affecting the approximate area contained by the third floor of High School in Pennsylvania, USA. SCP-664 is invisible to all observation and measurement thus far attempted, and is discernible only by its effect on living biological organisms. Living Biological Organisms Tests 5 through 12 detail species tested to date. Crossing the approximate outer edge of SCP-664 are invariably subject to spontaneous and instant disappearance, shortly after full immersion into SCP-664's area of effect. Testing to date has yet to satisfactorily establish whether time, distance, or other factors dictate the exact moment of disappearance. Non-living material, including clothing and equipment, are not affected by SCP-664's effect. SCP-664-1 is the collective term for any living biological organisms that re-emerge from SCP-664. To date, 67% of biological organisms entering SCP-664 have subsequently returned, with a higher and lower proportion for sapient and non-sapient organisms respectively. To date, the time recorded between disappearance and return ranges from 43 seconds at the lower limit to 142 days at the highest. Returning instances of SCP-664-1 have thus far been unable to provide descriptions of their experience during their period of absence. On 1999, routine intake DNA testing of D-4812-0 produced a match with researcher Daniel Ambridge of Foundation Employment since 1972, presently engaged in study of SCP- both were placed under high-level covert surveillance. On 1999, D-4812-0 was assigned for testing of SCP-664. On 1999, researcher Ambridge requested a transfer of assignment to SCP-664, which was approved, following consultation with Foundation Internal Monitoring Group. Following entry into SCP-664 by D-4812-0, and subsequent non-return after 300 days, researcher Ambridge was detained for questioning. Interview 664-12A Excerpt Present Researcher Daniel Ambridge Dr. Jennifer Stevenson Ambridge I'm pleased that you intervened when you did, and not before. I'd been worried about what would have happened to me if you had stopped him. Stevenson Do you mean D-48120? Ambridge. That's right. Myself, I should say. He didn't believe me at first. Would you believe it? But it didn't take long to wear him down, sharing some of our memories that nobody else knew about. About that Karen girl. About some of the crimes we knew nobody else knew about. About some of the nasty little details that I'm ashamed to admit to now. I was an unpleasant man back then, bound for death. This whole twist of fate gave me a fresh beginning and a head start to do something good with my life. I'm glad to have had the opportunity. Stevenson, describe again for me what you experienced following your entry into SCP-664. Ambridge, what more can I add? It was a long time ago, but I remember it quite well. One moment I'm there in the old school with the older me standing with his colleagues, watching and waiting with cold professionalism, hiding the collusion I knew he had underneath. All those days in my cell, with him talking me through every little detail of the Foundation, what I needed to do when I popped out the other side, how I needed to act and think. It was all a lot to take in. Apologies, you were asking about what happened when I stepped through? I'm afraid it's just like all the others. Just nothingness. How I came out, though, that was different, I grant you. One moment there, the next, I'm naked and frightfully cold falling into the hay wagon, just as my older self had described, every little detail. I found some clothes and made my way to and dear old Elsie was there just like he said she would be. A stranger to me then, of course, but she took me in, and from there, I followed the path he set out for me, until the day came when I realized I could no longer tell where I had ended, and he had begun. It was my turn to fulfill his half of the story, and my dear Elsie... She never knew that I had help getting into her heart, that I knew all along that our life together was destined. Excuse me a moment. Apologies, again. It doesn't do to get emotional, I know. 
May I ask, why did nobody stop me? If you've been watching all this time, surely you must have known I was preparing him, feeding him information about the Foundation and my life and how to work his way to become me. I loaded him up with so many secrets. Wouldn't all that be far too much of an unacceptable information breach? Stevenson, I am not in a position to say. Ambridge, yes, of course. Still, I can hypothesize. I'm pleased to see that the Foundation care more for the preservation of causality than of securing their secrecy. Stevenson, again, I am not in a position to say. Ambridge, so what happens now? Stevenson, I am not in... Ambridge, all right, I understand. I dare say I have little to complain about. Not every D-Class gets a chance to become an old man. Thank you, and I mean it. Thank you so very much for everything. Incident class. Unconfirmed. Unexplained. Assignment. Alpha Bravo. Event. At 2 p.m. on Thursday the 14th of March, 1969, a white male of age 20 to 25 was observed to appear in midair, approximately 30 feet above the ground of a field near Pennsylvania, USA. The male was observed by a Mr. Dan McBriar, into whose hay cart he is reported to have landed. Mr. McBriar reported the occurrence to local law enforcement, but the unknown male could not be located when apprehension was attempted. The unknown male remains at large, and has been designated Person of Interest 0001192. Item Number SCP-666 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-666 is to be stored in a monitored closed vault at all times at Site-73 in the Tibetan Mountains. Guards are to be changed weekly, must pass a background check before being assigned to their post, and proven free of drug and alcohol addiction. SCP-666 is to be entered only by D-Class personnel in approved testing procedures or by approved Foundation researchers with Level 4 or higher security clearance. Non-D-Class personnel who enter SCP-666, whether or not they have revealed a prior history of addiction, must be observed by a guard at all times. If they show any sign of being affected by SCP-666, they are to be removed immediately. Description SCP-666 is a medium-sized Tibetan yurt made of tied wooden branches and covered in yak leather. The interior ceiling is 2.44 meters, or 8 feet, high, and the base of the yurt is 9.14 meters, or 30 feet. The hut is circular in shape. The interior of the yurt has a dirt floor and appears to be as crude as the outside to the majority of observers. The branches that make up the yurt frame are wrapped in rabbit fur and tied with yak leather thongs. Periodically, SCP-666 will change its location within the confinement area. This will happen only when not under direct observation, but remote viewing gives the impression of an entity inside the structure lifting it wholly and moving to its new position. To date, it has not made any attempt to escape confinement. SCP-666 was discovered in 1973 by SCP operatives searching the mountain regions on reports of several missing persons having returned from the area, giving similar explanations. Seeking shelter during harsh weather, the individuals would happen upon SCP-666 by seeming happenstance. Having gone out in similar conditions, the exploration team was also able to discover the yurt. Of the three operatives present, two experienced no ill effects. The third entered a stupor, experiencing vivid hallucinations and muttering incoherently to himself. Upon retrieval of the team, the yurt was recovered and taken to nearby Site-73 for further investigation. When an individual with no history of significant addictions enters the yurt, the yurt remains dormant and seems to have no ill effects. Class D personnel without a history of alcohol or narcotics abuse were able to sit inside the yurt for days at a time if provided proper nourishment, and did report a greater intensity in their dreams. Individuals who have a history of substance abuse, however, will experience a hallucinogenic effect when inside the structure. 
In all instances, the subjects report being in a location either from their memories or a corollary thereof. Specifically, a spot where their addiction was at its most intense. Thus far, there have been reports of a nightclub bathroom, a 1973 Volkswagen Vanagon, a filthy alleyway, the casino in Las Vegas, etc. One subject reported finding himself in a dirty apartment with a prostitute named Chloe, with whom he frequently indulged in narcotics abuse. Another reported being in his own bedroom with a computer set up significantly more intricate than he owned before his arrest for distribution of child pornography. During these hallucinations, subjects report that they are confronted by an individual, referred to as SCP-6661. Depictions of SCP-6661 vary widely from person to person, with no commonality to race, gender, or appearance, beyond being typical for the surroundings. SCP-6661 will indulge the subject in their personal addictions, although, at the start, it will have a passive-aggressive attitude. As time progresses, the subject is encouraged to indulge further while simultaneously being encouraged to stop. Should the subject show remorse or a strong desire to give up their addiction, SCP-6661 will slowly adopt a more genuinely friendly tone and continue the temptation with discouragement hallucinations. Approximately 94% of subjects who have gone through this form of hallucination to their end have been diagnosed as having a near-complete removal of psychological addictions, though physical symptoms will persist through a natural withdrawal cycle. If the subject gives in to SCP-6661's temptations, the entity becomes increasingly hostile. There is no set timetable nor degree of indulgence, but if left unchecked, SCP-6661 will invariably begin assaulting the subject and forcing the subject's vice upon them to levels of extreme overdose. If the subject is not forcibly removed from SCP-666 during this period, they will die. Cause of death is typical of their addiction, whereby an alcoholic will suffer extreme kidney or liver failure, a cocaine user will develop cardiac dysrhythmia, a subject addicted to video games or television will suffer extreme muscle atrophy, and health issues associated with a sedentary lifestyle, etc. To date, there has been no clear connection between who will and will not succumb to SCP-6661. The working hypothesis is that it is simply a matter of the individual's willpower and conviction. All attempts to interview SCP-6661 directly have failed with the entity either redirecting the conversation or bluntly refusing to answer. The only statement that reveals anything to its nature was a single instance of, we're not important here, this is all about you. This indicates that there are either multiple entities attached to SCP-666, or there are additional instances of SCP-666 in the world. Investigation is ongoing as to whether similar stories have arisen. Should another instance of SCP-666 be discovered, it is to be transferred immediately to Site-73. Addendum SCP-6661 Nearly identical stories have recently arisen in remote areas of northern Canada, describing a Wendigo hut. While unconfirmed, their similarities point to at least one additional instance of SCP-666 at large. Addendum SCP-666-2 Interview Log with Test Subject D-14390 Regarding Experiences in SCP-666 Interviewer Dr. Lannis Interview Subject D-14390 Date 04-17-19 Dr. L Subject D-14390 How are you feeling? D-14390. Eh, not bad, Doc. Not bad. Kinda wanna take another nap in the tent. Dr. L. Well, that's what we're here to talk about. Please describe your experience inside of SCP-666. D-14390. <laughs> no sweat there, Doc. See, I just stroll in like you said. Have myself a seat. Next thing I know, I'm in this hole in the wall back home and with this sweet bitch, Chloe. Dr. L. Chloe. D-14390. 
Oh yeah, she was pricey, and she wasn't the best looking trick south of Kennedy, but she had some connections. Never did meet up with her once that we weren't getting high. Note, Chloe was the working name of the prostitute that D-14390 was with at the time of his arrest. Dr. L. Very well, please describe the scenario for me. D-14390. Well, it was her apartment, right? Kinda dingy, a little messy, like she hadn't cleaned it in a couple of weeks. But I wasn't there for the scenery, you know? So I drop my cash off on the living room table and we head into the bedroom. I shoot up with her, used my own needle of course, and then we get freaky. I mean, we did everything under the sun, and a couple that never saw the light of day. <laughs> she knew positions I never did, and had drugs I hadn't even heard of. About halfway through I needed a pick-me-up, so I snorted a couple of lines of Colombian off her ass and… Dr. L. I think that's enough. D-14390. For the sake of brevity, please keep the rest of your testimony in regards to the anomalous entity SCP-6661. D-14390. The what now? Dr. L. The person who tempted you in your hallucination. D-14390. Oh, right. Well, it was around the time that she was offering me this opium shit that she said she got off a Chinaman. The whole time she'd been saying stuff in kind of funny way, like those, uh, whatchamacallem, back-faced comments? Dr. L. Backhanded compliment. D-14390. That's the stuff. Well, I started taking a couple of pulls off the opium, and I'm feeling mellow, but she's just glaring at me, right? So I ask what's up, and she hauls off and punches me in the face. Not like this fragile little crack or what either. I mean, I thought I was going 10 with Tyson right about now. She starts screaming at me, calling me weak, saying I'm pathetic, just giving in, you know? So, I kick her in the chest, and that's when shit got weird. Next I know, she's got me on the ground and her arms are around my throat. Her eyes get huge and bloodshot and shit. I feel her nails digging into the sides of my neck, and hand to God, Doc, she was shooting shit into me. Dr. L, you're saying SCP-6661 was injecting you with heroin through her nails. D-14390, not sure what it was, but it burned and felt good at the same time. And they weren't nails no more, it was like big cat claws, right? And she's still yelling at me, but her mouth is getting bigger and bigger, like her jaws stretching out and her teeth keep getting sharper and bigger, like she's about ready to eat my head. Even as blasted as I was, that was some freaky shit, and I started screaming. Dr. L, and that was when the guards pulled you out of the tent. D-14390, yeah, seems I wasn't just freaking out in the dream. Weird shit it was. About like, five seconds after I get pulled out, I hear Chloe's voice again, but it's all low and growly. And it sounded like she said, you can't stop. Dr. L. Thank you, D-14390. I just have one last question. After all this, you said you wanted to go back in. Why? D-14390. Well, it's simple, right? <laughs> she was scary and all, but man, I've never been that high in my life. And with the shit that goes on in this place, I figured I'm not long for the world anyway, so I may as well go out with a smile, right? Note: Following the interview, D-14390 repeatedly volunteered for additional testing with SCP-666. Dr. Lannis finally relented. D-14390 began screaming approximately three seconds after entering the hallucinatory state, and expired from cardiac arrest less than one minute later. Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, subscribe to SCP Orientation right now and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.